Marconi's first ever year-round bourbon was an inspiration. It all had to work together. A blend of carefully selected ingredients, Texas-sized pot stills, and creative people determined to find the absolute best way to usher a new whiskey along. When you discover how it pairs with a meaningful moment, suddenly the feeling of drinking great whiskey becomes a whole lot more. Hey everybody, welcome to this week's episode of Whiskey Neat, spirited conversations with interesting people. I'm not giving you an ad read today because instead of doing our ad reads at the beginning, we thought it would be apropos to sandwich it right in the middle of an important conversation. This week I sit down with Robert Licorice of Iron Root Distillery and Jared Hempstead of Balcones. Uh, it's actually pronounced Balcones. And uh, we will be discussing why Texas whiskey is on the rise. Obviously, you guys know this is a Texas-based show. Uh, we love Texas whiskey. We also love bourbon. We love everything. But uh, for some bizarre reason, and there are a few great ones, Texas whiskey has exploded. So this week, I sit down with two icons of Texas whiskey. Uh, we sit down to discuss why the landscape has been so insane even in the last 12 months it's been that insane so please rate and review the show on itunes please 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 take time go to itunes go to stitcher go to youtube whatever the case might be subscribe rate and review the show without further ado please welcome jared Hempstead and robert licorice cheers <laughs> Why Texas is on the rise. I once, and this is just my perspective, feel free to add some conjecture here and there, but I once, uh, many times actually, have said that I think celebrities, you can launch a brand off celebrity. We know this to be true. Yeah. But you can't sustain a brand on celebrity. The product actually has to be worth buying. It has to, it has to be valuable. People have to see the value in it, and it has to be worth drinking. That's why I think a lot of celebrity brands fall face first uh 80 proof largely two-year-old for 70 bucks i'll give a shout out to uh, uh terry bradshaw just launched his own bourbon mm -hmm. and it's like sub 50 bucks 40 some bucks and it's like 60 is 58 percent alcohol like it's got a decent proof on it you've got value you've got celebrity you've got i haven't tasted it yet but it's kentucky bourbon so i'm sure it's not god awful but you, you're hitting all the, the marks there. Yeah. And one thing that Texas has done, one thing that Balcones has really like hit the nail on the head with is you guys, as you've grown, you've dropped your cost, your shelf price. Texas was launched off the pride of Texas, in my opinion. I think people were very proud of Texas. A lot of us have stars and Texas-shaped symbols on our bottles. Not multiple stars. There's only one star, Chris. Come on, please. <laughs> That's right. My apologies. Uh, I think... Some people put it front and center, yeah. but you know. Yeah, and a ribbon around it. And yeah. uh, I think I think it just, it, it's fine to launch a brand that way, but on, on top of the fact that the, the juice has gotten better and, and everyone's matured with experience, mm -hmm. the prices are dropping. You're, 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 you've got this love for Texas, love for community, love for the mom and pop feel of Texas distilleries. I, I feel like this, these are the key factors that are really launching Texas success. I think a lot of us want to be able to afford our own whiskey. I think at the end of the day is is a, is a big issue on that. And that, for me, I know, it, again, this comes from, again, not that a lot of people know this yet, but again, a lot of our learning was done from Jared and Balcones. Like they, they're they're the uh, the grandfather of, of the Texas whiskey movement, and for us, like again, learned a ton from them, and I think that's. Again, a huge part of the culture of Texas whiskey making it comes from Balcones and their willingness to to teach and to 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 kind of. Ex it's pronounced Balcones. By Balcones, <laughs> uh, Balcones, uh, and to give a lot of their experience. And again, one of the things that I know Jared taught me early on was like, "Hey, you can be really proud of your product, but also then that you you may have to buy your own product. So make sure you can afford it." And so for us. Price point's always been a big issue. And that's why for us, like, again, high proof stuff, I try to, we try to keep it around 50 bucks. Um, 
low proof again you can go a little bit lower again i think balcony is against killing it with the pot still down at that 25 30 buck price point i think is phenomenal for it's insane yeah it's it's a great value and i think that's where i you know they're we're both succeeding is on price point and keeping it there i mean i know it's an industry that you can absolutely start with the goal of having a luxury brand like people do that like that's the whole point like they're going to drop a new product or a new a new they're going to rebrand it's the same distillery the same company but they got this new thing that's coming out and the whole point is that it's going to be 245 bucks and it's going to be in f- really fancy bottles and blah 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 but i don't think that's what anybody in texas set out to do um so yeah i mean i've told the story a bunch of times but when you when you have friends family neighbors that don't buy your stuff because to you know to a lot of folks still uh especially 10 years ago even 30 35 40 bucks was like oh man booker's at 45 back in the day our bag 10 at 60 it's like, yeah. oh my gosh i remember we do that like once a year twice a year maybe really I, splurge i remember not being able to afford our bag oogie yeah you know and just thinking it's too it's too expensive and yeah. now the i mean I, and i've given whistle pig uh a hard time uh, two years ago when the show launched uh 70 bucks for a 10 year old rise too much now it's reasonable <laughs> and that's what i've said i said they haven't raised their prices yeah. and in fact a lot of their single barrel picks are 15 year old 16 year old stuff uh f- for nowadays in today's current environment thanks to people like kentucky al uh it, it's well within reason to the expectation has changed and that's so great the to availability me. Availability has changed. Mm-hmm. The availability has changed. The expectation has changed. Where people are expecting to pay more, and you're still dropping the price down, so yeah. that it's more you can introduce someone to it. I, I think the key to Texas' success has relied in ignoring the where I think it's fair to say Kentucky's been heading in the opposite direction. Right. Right. Kentucky, as the popularity has increased, K- Kentucky's becoming. Kentucky is directly responsible for the for the rise in Armagnac and the rise in rum and the rise in these other spirits where people are realizing, oh, I can buy a 30-year-old Armagnac for a hundred bucks. Right. Yeah. And you can buy a 12-year-old Kentucky bourbon for a hundred bucks. And it's like, well, what are we doing? You know, I mean the whole argument, the defense for Texas at the very beginning was simply that you gotta understand these companies out of uh, Kentucky have been producing spirits for two hundred years. Uh, they've got the costs down because they're working on a much larger scale. So Texas distilleries obviously have to charge more. Well, now it's like, well, well, what do we say? It's the, it's, it's the, it's the opposite. It's the opposite, right? Um, and I, can, I think at some level you, you understand that in the 60s, 70s, 80s, they were suffering and they cut prices uh, to deal with that. I mean, they were just trying to survive at that point. And now they're on the opposite end of the market and they're trying to take cash advantage in. of it, cash yeah. in for the fact that they exist so long. So, I mean, at, at some level you're like, okay, I get, I understand that now you're trying to make your money on it. But I mean, for us, again, at the end of the day, it's about being able to afford your own whiskey and being proud of that. And for us, I think it's being value conscious, I think is a big thing. I like to me, I think old granddad 114 is to me has been a fantastic standard throughout the years at twenty two dollars. Yeah, and it's fin- phenomenal. Yeah. And uh, or a wild turkey rare breed. I think, and that to me has been my kind of gold standard of making sure that I'm being reasonable when we're we're, we're talking price point. And there's something to be said too about. I mean, I'm not really at my heart like a business guy, but there is kind of a life cycle, mm-hmm. and we're still we'll, we're all still in these like early year growth phases, yeah. which is very different than when I see kind of industry reports and watching fill in the blank top five top six like international conglomerate spirit brands fighting over like a 2.3 percent growth and like who's going to get that you know what i mean um so we just we have a completely different we have different dilemmas yeah. what kind of growth um, has texas seen annually i know and correct me if i'm wrong robert and we can cut this out if we need to but i, I remember earlier this year I don't remember when. It could have been a couple of months ago. It could have been six months ago. You had mentioned that this year, <clears throat> in the first quarter, you guys had sold as much as you sold for all of last year. Yeah, we we surpa- by June we surpassed all of our sales from last year. Yeah. So within the first half of the year, you already were were in the hundred percent growth range. Right. 
which was insane. And again, it's been an insane year. Um, again, we can talk about awards and all and the benefits and cons of, of that. And but, I give, let me say yeah, something on that yeah. real quick. I, I give you a hard time. Oh, actually, I don't give you a hard time. I don't give anyone a hard time. I'm a very nice guy. Uh, but but <laughs> what? <laughs> but you are conscious. Yeah. You prefaced it because you are conscious of the the um, cynical nature of the hobbyists who have a hard time with awards. And, right. And we've talked about that in depth and agree completely. But it does have an effect on yeah. movement of sales. There's no denying that. There's a reason why Spirits Brands enter competitions. If if it didn't have an impact on the bottom line, no one would do it. Yep. And again, I, I, I would also have to say that also, like when you make something and you take a lot of pride in making it, when someone recognizes that you do a good job, it makes you feel good. Sure. So again, I think Balcones, what, 2011, when you guys won Best in Glass with a single malt for the first time, like it was a it was a breakout moment for you guys. And for us, that, that was this year with, with the Whiskey Magazine stuff and for us we've highly benefited from that and I, I there's no denying that at the end of the day um again we were we've been growing year over year i think uh, one i think we've been making product better product year over year over the last couple of years um but also like us as a craft brand we haven't been as much invested into the on-premise market which is what took the huge hit this year i mean like again i that's again, uh, again, raising money for some of the, the the tragedy that's happened on the on premise side has been a big focus from a lot of us this year um, because it's it's insane and it's really really tragic. Um, but being a brand that wasn't heavily involved in that, as so we didn't take the hit from that this year. Either, sure. So. Same thing. We we never really did the destination model. I guess we 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 got in early enough where that wasn't really. Now that's a full thing. You can make this thing that like, yeah, we may not even distribute much. That's not even part of the plan. We're going to make a cool place. We're going to have. To be clear, a, you mean the, for people to come to visit. Right, right. right. Like, like, a, like more like a vineyard, you know, winery model. Sure. Where like, no, we're going to, people are going to come here. Treaty Oak's a great example. Um, we didn't do that. So same thing. A lot of the, a lot of the uh, shutdowns and all that stuff on didn't site. Well, that was never really a part that we kind of treated that. And historically almost more like, um, PR, this is exposure, you know, if it pays for itself and we got 10,000 people came through here this year, like that's a win, you know. Uh, It does seem to be that if you have a brand that was heavily reliant on the sale of a bottle versus the sale of a glass, uh, this year it didn't hurt as much. I'd agree with that. And people that were more entrenched with distribution, um, yeah, overall distribution throughout it. So, yeah, I mean... What do you mean? We've got what twenty members now in the in the Texas Whiskey Association, and I don't know how many. And I understand why people sometimes don't want to answer these kinds of questions, but it makes it hard to kind of accumulate good volume data and even volume data broken down into like, you know, what are you selling out of the front of house? What's going off premise? What's going on premise? But we have people that don't have distribution, like they don't have deals. You know, they're. Selling, they're surviving off on, destination. Yeah, yeah, they're selling everything out of front of house, and uh, and you know some of the distributors and some of the chains aren't picking up new stuff even before this happened. Yeah. You know, and obviously this year especially not. So the divide, unfortunately, I think the divide is going to get kind of spread yeah, out. Yeah. Um, and so in what regard? Nobody knew. Well, more, hopefully, more than destination mean, guys versus the people who had been invested in distribution. Oh, I think, sure. Yeah. And people have been trying forever. I mean, uh, getting that getting distribution stuff figured out for a smaller producer in Texas, especially right now has, has been hard for a few years. Um, so if you were already in there, you're, you're kind of going to be all right and have been mostly during this year. Um, when I'm at divide wise, I just mean there's, there's nobody knew what was coming, but if there's some things, if there's, there's some boxes you had checked with your business by the time this happened, those brands are actually having growth years. And then there's some other people that are like, are we going to make it the year? Which is yeah. what everyone's been saying. But um, I think there was some some statistic, and you can uh, correct me on this. Something like sixty percent of Texas distillers make close. That was the the info we were given. Again, ultimately, I don't know exactly what that's going to be because again, some people have made some really fantastic shifts, pivots, yeah, yeah, pivots, and moved around. And again, I think that's a lot of credit to the to the entrepreneurs that are taking that on and moving with the way the world's approaching them. But that was, yeah, that was that's information. Sixty percent of the craft distillers could have 
could close by the by the end of the next year, um, which is to me super troubling. It's uh, it, one of the most exciting things about the last decade has been the growth of craft distilling. I think you've seen a lot of influence. Uh, again, it's to me you read an article about Buffalo Trace investing heavily in. Uh, in heirloom corns and doing different heirloom corn distillations. I think that, to me, that, that's a response and a, a absorption, a hug of kind of the craft movement and what, again, what Balcones is one of the people that started that. It was exploring new corns and doing some of the small things that small producers can do. And the fact that we may lose some of those small producers, especially after you talk about the importance of the sanitizer and distribution of sanitizer throughout the co- uh, country. Like, and that's something that we've talked about pretty heavily is that even though the small producers may not have been making the sanitizer themselves, they were able to receive sanitizer from some larger producers. So like Gulf Coast here in Houston was able to sell or send out uh, sanitizer throughout the entire state because the way you can transfer things between distilleries. Yeah, DSPs. And, and we were literally able to cover the entire state to get sanitizer to all the first responders and and without the distilleries in different parts of the state, you wouldn't have been able to do that. And it's one of the beautiful things about having all these small distilleries all over the place, just like pre-prohibition. Like we had 2,000 plus distilleries. And I think it's a really beautiful part of the culture that we've gotten back in the last 10 to 15 years. Yeah, I think Gulf Coast uh, is a bit of an unsung hero because I know, I don't know if I've said this on the show, and this is not a slight to anyone, but a lot of distilleries have cult followings, right? right. Malconi's is cult following. A lot of people love Iron Root. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Whitmire's, I, there was this big story about them donating 6,000 gallons of, of sanitizer, and they did. They did, you know, they obviously that no one gives back more, but uh, at that time, we had, I picked up a pallet from Carlos over at Gulf Coast to distribute to some group members. Just at the time, everybody was, there was literally, uh, drop-off points throughout the city where anyone right. who needed sanitizer could just come by and get some. And at that point, I think Carlos was at 100,000, 150,000 gallons of yeah. sanitizer. Just given away. Just get, yeah. just th- 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 just the amount of, and quietly, no yeah. press release or anything. Yep. No one kind of knew about it. And I was like, I, I don't think he realizes how much I appreciate. Uh, I couldn't, it blew my mind. And he gave a pallet to the group and we ha- I stood out in the sun handing it out. <laughs> Uh, so I mean, really, as, I'm as a, a hero. ginger, it's a very I'm big sacrifice. I, I, that's what well, I'm trying understand. to make clear. You risked like, your he, life for that. <laughs> he may have given a hundred thousand gallons. You I stood die. out in the sun yeah. for four hours. Yeah, you know, I, get I, it. I was. You may not find out for like a decade what that cost you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's horrifying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the joke's a little yeah. closer home. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. What do you think the biggest roadblocks are currently for Texas distilleries? Things are on the up upswing. You're obviously seeing some explosive growth. What's your I think for us, it's it when you have an expectation of what something's suppo- supposed to taste like, and then you don't get that, then your immediate reaction tends to be like, "Oh, well, this is not good." You're talking well, about the Kentucky thing. Yeah, it's like especially a- on the bourbon side. Like, I expect bourbon is going to taste like within a certain range. Again, you and I have been talking for years of the that bourbon has such a finitive flavor profile. And I think that's probably one of the biggest issues that people talk about is that bourbon versus scotch is that bourbon has a very defined flavor wheel of what it's supposed to come from. And when you bring in a bourbon that comes from outside of that, a lot of people's initial reaction to that is it's not good or there's something – there's an issue with Their that. Their expectations are off. Right. It's not, it's not within what I'm expecting. Let's be fair. There are things about Texas whiskey – it's almost. It's also kind of disingenuous to talk about Texas whiskey as a thing, as one monolith, because it's not. The climate is usually what everyone talks about, and like we don't all have the same climate. So, yeah, the cachet, the kind of social capital that the brand of Texas has, which you mentioned, like right when we started, we all get to have that, right? But what they deal with versus what we deal with versus what someone's dealing with down here, like. Are, Ninety different. It's not the same. We don't have the same the issues. We don't have the for, same things we're one. trying to figure out. Sure. Humidity, temperature swings, you name it. So wait, Scotland can have five different regions. You put Scotland over the top of Texas, and you're looking at <clears throat> Scotland's significantly smaller than yeah, Texas. Yeah. So, but yeah, depending on even you know if you're talking to like a biologist or geologist, we've got anywhere from eight to twelve different you know, recognized 
you know, bioregions. So I think our issues are going to be different. So it's a little bit weird to talk about it as if we all have the same stuff. But for where we're at anyway, I, we, do, we do firmly believe that experimentations with entry proof well, well, also, I think what's the, what's I mean, everyone just thinks everything's overwooded, right? That's the main problem. Yeah, I used That's to get, the, I used to give problems. it a useful bite and mention specifically kind of a. I always said the word benzene, mm -hmm. like a get like that. There's a specific and smell. Then you, then you found out what that was. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, people can't drink benzene without dying. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, but but like a like a, almost like a uh, a fuel additive, distinct, aggressive gasoline note you remember how, you know how good gasoline smells from a distance when it's an aroma but if you get it on your your body it's horrible yeah. you know it's like that there there was something about texas whiskey early on that had kind of a youthful bite that was very yeah there's a gasoline salt. and hay yeah. Yeah. you know and now it's changed it's evolved greatly a lot majorly in part by you two sitting across from me right now i mean texas is now uh, much more diverse in its flavor profile and what it can produce and what it can offer. And all of it isn't even like, I give bourbon a hard, I love bourbon, but I give bourbon a hard time because the best, the, the range, the palette of flavors for, for scotch is tenfold what you can get from bourbon. Bourbon is a very much narrower lane of brown sugar and caramel and classic what you think bourbon is. Texas is shaping up to be more like scotch. You're getting a much wider spectrum because you guys are like, I'll try this grain, I'll try this barrel, I'll try this char, I'll throw some honey in it, I'll see it. Like the 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 progressive nature of we just want something that tastes good. Yeah. Again, yeah, and we're not burdened by the historical perspective necessarily. Now, again, a lot of us use that as a perspective. I know. Yeah, but there's not 200 years or. Right. We there's nothing we have to. There's, there's barely a decade. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I know you guys learned in. Early on, you had a lot of Brooklotti influence in what you guys were doing. Um, I mean, obviously influenced by you guys, number one, but also um, this high French has a Brooklotti yeah. note to it. Does it? Yeah, yeah. You um, get a lot of cognac influence from us. I mean, it's. I think that's the beautiful thing. You have different pro producers that are influenced from different areas, and that really takes hold in the distillate that we make, and that's why we're so different. And again. As Jared mentioned earlier, there is no monolith of Texas whiskey. You can't taste one Texas whiskey and be like, all right, that's this is what they're going to taste like. That's honestly, it's completely ridiculous. I mean, it's there's such a diversity. And we also don't have to be overly defensive. Let's all, yeah. I mean, let's all be honest. The whiskey was worse 10, 12 years ago. And it keeps getting better. better. Yeah. So it's not just the Kentucky thing. There's, there's more going on than that. Sure. And it's disingenuous, I think, to say that, oh, it's just because people were used to Kentucky bourbon or Indiana no. bourbon. But that is the that is a, a, bo a boiled down perspective. Of that what, is still a factor. Yeah. yeah, that Texas is going to produce different kind of whiskey. Jared, what was the what was the age of your very first whiskeys that you released? Uh, five weeks old. Five weeks. The first baby blue bottling was five weeks Versus old. Versus we were broke. Today is completely different thing. Yeah. So. Anyone who tried your sure. product a decade ago versus now, it's a, it's a completely different thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Some largely in, like that. Largely in Texas. Ooh. I mean, in craft distilling nationwide, there's a ton of Harriet Watt grads and stuff like that. But Texas is mostly some pretty soft, self-taught, a pretty self-taught scene compared yeah. to other states even. Um, not, there's not a lot of people running around that got into this after getting a brewing or distilling degree. Um, so, yeah, there was, there was a learning curve. There still is. I think there's still a million things to figure out. Um, I think, I think decade, specifically yeah. with Virgin Oak, we started on American whiskey styles, bourbon and rye. Sure, everyone's climate's different, but for us, entry proof and large formats, we think is that I mean some combination Feature. of the right entry proof lower and the right entry size proof or higher entry proof. Lower. So you guys are and this is something we've also kind of touched on a few times. Early on the perspective was high entry proof, maximum allowed, and small barrels. Right? Yeah. Super small barrels. Oof. To kind of shortcut the aging and have more surface high to wood tan, ratio. High yeah, tannic, yeah. right. Now you're saying that the secret of Texas whiskey, because of our climate, is the opposite. Right. If Lower we want it to get older, we're trying to figure out, like, can we have ten year old mainly -year -old. bourbon and single malt? Can we make them in a way that we're happy to let them sit for 8 to 12 and still have it come out, like, really great, you know? Um, I think so those are the two things that we think are kind of, at least for us, that's our next attempt at, at, at turning the 
the secret code on the padlock and seeing if it, if it opens. But we intentionally skirted the most popular American styles, which were bourbon and rye, for, I don't know, about six, eight years. Yeah, the, the vast majority of your um, existence. Corn whiskey, which was overdue. Everybody loves mellow corn. No, no problem with mellow corn. But, you know, the stuff in the mason jars or in the little ceramic jug that you can feel like you're a hillbilly. Corn whiskey was overdue for someone just to, like, just re- to reset the paradigm. Yeah. Like. It, I love doing it when we're out when we're out in the market talking to people and stuff and be like, who's ever walked into a liquor store and said, hey, where's your corn whiskey? Like nobody. The, the answer's nobody. Um, so it was ripe. So we we kind of intentionally chose to work in different directions. But in the same thing, as soon as you say American single malt, um, unlike just saying bourbon, it's from Texas, and then you're like, well, this isn't like any bourbon I've had. You start saying American single malt, well, like we already have set the stage. You know this is not Scotch or Irish. Done. Like you, but also there's no, there's no sub region of American single malt. No, no one says Texas single malt. They'll say American single malt. Well, what is this? It's an American. They should single say single Texas single malt. We said Texas single malt in the bottle. But my point being, as soon as you said American single malt, or Indian single malt, or Japanese single, malt, like you've already, there's already no expectation that this is going to be Scotch because you've already you've already kind of put a qualifier on it, Correct. right? So some of the drama and some of the think the, the palate frustration and you know surprise that happens from having non-Kentucky bourbon when you maybe don't realize every bourbon you've ever had is from Kentucky and this one's from Pennsylvania or this one's from Texas or this is from wherever doesn't happen. This is American single malt. You already know going in not to expect scotch. So in some ways that category has been easier for us and Westland and Cole Keegan and everybody to play around in because you're already assuming it's going to be different. And honestly, people like Cavalan and Paul John and Amru and that, yeah. they, they had already, they, they're, we actually have global partners that are helping set that stage for like, no, 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 no. I mean, Westward, uh, uh, Starward down Australia, every, you name it. Here's Scotch. Cool. Here's Irish. Cool. And then there's this global world malt f- phenomenon that's happening that we're a part of this much bigger conversation. Well, and it's also, they're all grouped together too. Oh, sure. It's grouped well, as world malt. Yeah. I, I, we'd like to be in that spot. They don't really know what to do with a lot of Texas brands. We get in weird spots <laughs> in stores sometimes. Sure. Um, our single malt could just as easily be with bourbon as anywhere else, depending on the store you're in. But um, yeah, the, we're, I mean, there's the, the growth of the small producer phenomenon is pretty young still, even though uh, St. George's, Triple uh, Eight, McCarthy's. There's people that have been doing this for a long time, but it wasn't a movement. They've just been around for a long time. Sure. Um, well, it's like Jermaine Rabon. They're, they're brandy. Sure. Oldest brandy. Pre- I've got a bottle of 30-year-old American brandy, and I don't want to open it. Yeah. It's, it exists, or, it's right? gorgeous, by the way, yeah, yeah. In, case you're, in case you're wondering. But, but we're, we're, we're in its infancy, and beer, beer's been through it. I think, I think beer guys still consider that we're kind of on third wave, but... But when at, every, at every wave, is, what eighty two was the when they started? I, oh, I don't know. I mean, you're talking cra- craft, quote unquote, spirits is thirty eight years old. Yeah. It's old. Um, the movement, I wouldn't say, gained, gained any momentum until much later. Yeah. But thirty years later, um, two thousand eight. Some yeah. of the some of the early value that beers even seen this happen. At, at first, it's just cool enough that someone's making beer like three blocks from your house, and you can walk to it. When there's, you fast forward a decade and now there's 10 options within walking distance of your house, you're going to go to the one that's good. And so that can only last so long. And just like the Texas branding thing, that can get you, that can get all of us started, right? Yeah. Um, But it's not sustainable. It won't, it won't carry you through. And hopefully people are smart enough to realize to not, not put all their eggs in that basket. They're like, I'm going to make a bunch of money off the Texas brand. Um, the liquid's, got, the liquid's got to be good. And that's it's not the, just the Texas brand, though. It, it's it's uh, there's people first uh, distillery in Waco since Prohibition. It's but I mean they're hitting all the sales points. But sure. the, By the way, I think it's beautiful that they were making single pot still whiskey in Waco before Prohibition, which was the crazy thing that I had no idea that someone unearthed that there was a distillery in Waco that was doing pot still whiskey before like 1910 which is insane that there is actually history here. There's history before uh, Prohibition. And I think, again, that's one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that the U.S., there were 
2,000 plus distilleries in the country prior to prohibition. <laughs> and just like breweries, we're, we're, we're getting back to that. We're getting yeah, back, yeah, to, yeah. A, to, getting a, back to, that. to a pre-prohibition standard, um, like numbers. But yeah, I mean, the fact of the matter is if you like have all these local options, local matters, just like with buying eggs, right? Will I pay more? Yeah. And these are like in the county, one county over at my farmer's market. Sure. Like we care if you care about that stuff. Um, so without being too just like, you know, accountant about it, like how much is that worth per bottle? Is that worth five bucks to you extra to know it's local? Is it 10? I don't, I don't know. It depends yeah. on the consumer, right? That's it depends also- on the threshold, but it also, you got to think about repeat business. Again, sure. the same resistance someone has to buying a second celebrity bottle is the same resistance they have to, oh, I understand and accept that I'm paying a little bit more for Texas whiskey, but that may limit my future purchases to maybe one bottle per sure. year versus four bottles per year. Which has been the beautiful thing over the last, only for I mean, I know for us, I mean, I can only imagine for you guys for years before that, but that is a thing that's starting to develop. I think you're seeing a love of regionality in the United States. I think it's something that's really beautiful. Southeastern, Southwestern, Northeastern, Northwestern, like spirits made in different parts of the country taste different. They're the way they mature is very different. Um, again, one of the most exciting distillers for me on, on the East coast is Rua. Uh, I don't know if you ha- haven't had a Rua single malt yet. I haven't, but Fred on the last episode, Fred Minnick did the last episode. He said, I said, give me two, I've of got, your surprise yeah. winners for the year and give me two losers for the year. Like, don't buy it. Rua was the first thing out of his South mouth. South Carolina, beautiful single malt, sherry cask, port cask. Again, next time I come down, I'll, I'll bring some bottles because drinking those guys for a couple of years now. Rua's great. Killer. RUA? Uh, yeah, RUA. It's it's Kavalon style. like, And it's it's beautiful. And I, I, I can't, it's one of those things you can't, speak enough about is this beautiful regionality developing in the United States. And again, I think Balcones was honestly the first one to really define that for Texas. You guys are the first ones to go, Hey, guess what? Things mature differently here and it's beautiful. And I, I think this is something we should all celebrate and people began celebrating that. And I think that's been a boon to Texas whiskey in general. Um, I think, Honestly, the 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 opinion of Texans and Texas whiskey, you know, uh, pride in Texas whiskey is a boon to Texas whiskey as well. But I think it's all those things, climate, the opinion, all those things have helped Texas whiskey rise. And I think we're one of the first regions to really develop ourselves. And I think you're going to see that more and more through the coming years. And again, I can't tell you how excited I am to see these other regions really go because – Again, when we're talking single malt, you got Rua, which I'm really excited about. You've got uh, the guys out in Arizona um, that do a, a single malt out there that's uh, – it's, uh, it's not El Dorado, but it's – Delbach? Delbach is – again, if you guys haven't had a, a chance to try a Delbach, especially their winter releases, uh, the Madeira release is killer. Like, shout out to those guys. It's amazing. I think there's beautiful things happening and small craft distilleries there we're starting to, again for some of us we have a product that we make that's our primary product and we have other things we make that we just let and sit like for us our brandy i've got brandy now at six years old that i won't release till it's 10 to 12 years old oh my gosh yeah and i'm telling you that's coming from all parts of this country and it's gonna be beautiful like again mccarthy's there's some mm-hmm. mccarthy's that are really old single morgan yeah they're gorgeous um, <laughs> interesting nice. background noise. Uh, so let me ask you. So I asked you, what are the biggest resistors in the growth of Texas whiskey? You mentioned a perception or expectation of it tasting more like Kentucky. What's anything else you can think of? The first thing that comes to my mind potentially, which may or may not be on your list, uh, as far as what's the biggest hindrance to the growth of Texas whiskey would be our laws around uh, selling more than one bottle at each distillery or two bottles per month, whatever the case might two be. Two bottles per person every 30 days. Do, do the Does the idea of Walmart fighting this battle or Amazon fighting this battle to be able to order booze online, does it excite you or worry you? 
You know what? Uh, there's a lot of things that excite me. Um, I think for in us, general? yeah, in general, I get I get very, very excited. excited. <laughs> I just got married, so a lot of things excite me these days. Um, shout out to my <laughs> wife; she's great, wonderful. Um, but I, I honestly think that an expansion of laws allowing uh, all Texas companies to be able to share what we do here with a wider audience is a better situation. And again, I I think. There's going to be constantly battles on any state of sales and all uh, everything that has to go along with that. Um, there you go, buddy. Do you think marijuana will be legal? I hope before so. Before or after the 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 selling of uh, booze door to door. Honestly, I believe marijuana will do it before booze, just because of the way that the 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 powers of be work. But I really they don't have a huge like middle tier that's like. Have a, has a vested interest for a hundred years or whatever, and and keeping their and their piece of the pie on on weed. So. I I hope that all the tiers we we reflect more of what what's being done in Kentucky. And again, the guys up at um, I know like Fred's group that sells all the the bottles around them and all their picks. Like that's not Fred Sealbox. Sealbox. Um, that's not Fred. It's uh, what's his name? Uh, Kenny. Yeah, uh, you, you're, no. you're your best friend, right? No, well, what do you mean? I like uh, Kenny. Ken, Kenny is your best friend. Kenny, oh, because of the last episode when yeah, I was giving yeah, a hard time. I did, yeah, yeah. Ken, Kenny and Ryan have pursuit series. They have they got a DSP or whatever for but, that whole thing. But that all goes through Sealbox for the most not, part. Not everything. Not everything. In some states they do, but Sealbox is uh, a different guy. No, I forget his name. Okay. Tip of my tongue. Sure. Um, well, I hope everybody. I don't know gets anything. The, the you rules guys just said. that Sealbox have. Sure. That's, that's my my goal at the end of the day. Is that. We have a more uniform law within with throughout the U.S. because we've had some wonderful partners. I know for us and for some other companies. This is ridiculous, by the way. Thank you, thank you very much. This brandy, six-year-old Chenin Blanc, Texas brandy. Where is this really hot proof for for, for Elevage and? Uh, oh, I don't. I haven't finished watering oh, yeah. it down yet. Don't you worry, girl. It's got six years to go. Jared, you can like please. slowly dilute in Texas and have it like not work. Yeah. If you go too slow, just, it won't. I'm compensating more more or less is what we're yeah. doing. Um, but I, I honestly believe that oh. hope that we have kind of throughout the country rules. Like again, I know the Vermont guys, again, we've had some really wonderful relationships I know, with you guys. You did the vatted malt with lost lander and up in Vermont and they've, they've been able to sell product. Who? Uh, it's, it's a company called lost lantern. lost lantern. Oh yeah. Yeah. They're like me. Yeah. They're Adam, independent Adam bottlers. And same bottle shape, same style of label and. Except they're out of Vermont, sure, and therefore they can sell to like forty-two states. Oh wow! Because of all of their partners, not Texas, but no, 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 no. They they're can... the Vermont guys can sell to Texas oh, yeah. because TABC. I did see the Lost Center guys. They did a barrel pick with you guys or whatever it was. Yeah, two years ago. Yeah, and they've held on the product for two years, and now they finally sold it this year. It's Adam and Nora, and Adam used to work at Whiskey Magazine, so he they're so yeah, wonderful people. He started following me on Twitter shortly after I saw the uh, the launch. I'm not good at Twitter. I don't understand how that thing works. Yeah. It works a lot like Reddit, essentially. What was the first thing you, the thing before this? That was a Pinot de Chiron <clears throat> bourbon. So a bourbon finished in Pinot de Chiron. Again, I must have missed that. I got to tell you, everything on this table is. You didn't give me anything. And and I, but look, Balcony sponsors the show, but this is an unsolicited comment. Uh, the Grand Crew, the Highlands. All of those are fantastic. The Iron Root's not a sponsor at all, Highlands so great. you know it's coming from a place of love. Tremendous day drinking with you guys. Cheers, man. Yeah, yeah we're again half the fun. But the, and the ram, the ramblings usually like my strong suit. But I, I would like to answer the questions. Like it seems like we kind of had two bookends, but like how this got going, why it matters, and then kind of like our challenges. And I feel like I know I've, I've danced around it and then like not You're the leader in this, so you, you should answer this um, question. Actually, you're the leader president of the yeah, Texas yeah, Whiskey been Association. Been He's the original leader. There though. was a there was a, the transition to power was mm. yeah um, coup d'état. <laughs> it's, he debated you, the votes we're a couple still times. We're still counting, but you not didn't bad. have to egg his house. Yeah. Like he was gonna turn it over. It's not that big of a deal. You know, it was in Waco though, so no yeah. one really cared. Yeah, so. yeah. nobody. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> the uh, there's there's a life <laughs> there's a there's a life cycle to craft phenomena, whether it's local meat whether it was beer whether it's wines if it's like local cheese people like whatever all of those 
there's, there's kind of some cult, there's some cultural things that are going on that make that possible and endearing, right? Part of what I think worked for Texas is, and really for the nation, is just serendipitous. Like nobody really knew. It wasn't like us and Dan or the guys up at Hudson or fill in the blank that people just like had their hand, their, they had just knew what was going on and like now's the time to strike. But you made something that tasted different. Well, people were just ready. They, we were at points in our lives where that's what was, that was, that was just what we're about to do, period. We're going to go do that. It just worked out that like, man, it was the right time. It was the right time to be early and a little ahead of the curve. And Texas had us and Dan. And I, I think that's a big part of what kind of set that off right from the get go. Once again, him going with a very traditional style and us saying, we're going to avoid those traditional styles on purpose. Um, once again, feel how you feel about the awards and the ratings. Some of the stuff with him and Jim Murray, um, the, the best in glass thing. Shit, even the San Francisco uh, in 2010, we got double gold for baby. And we literally just sent it in hoping for feedback. We're like, we've what, bottled what like three times this? corn whiskey, people who have never done anything like this before. No training, learning on the fly. And to have come back and like, yeah, it's unanimous. This is the best corn whiskey we had in the whole thing. It's like, whoa. Oh, and then, you know, someone wants to come and do an interview or something. You're all of a sudden like, oh, crap, we probably had to get our shit together. Um, so there's a little bit of the lightning striking that happened, I think, with Texas. That's just like it is It is what it is. It's what happened. And it, and it, and it helped. Um, but once again, that's got to turn into like cost-effective, delicious stuff Yeah, but it, at the end of the day, right? At the end of the day, you've been able to sell your single malt all across the country. And I think – Internationally been, as well. Yeah, internationally. I think what's been beautiful is that that – all those things have translated to across the country. I mean, how many states are you currently sold in, Jared? Uh, be, be warned that if your number is lower than what Robert's number is, he's I, going to say it. Victory. No. It's like 40-something. Exactly. Exact same. And we're... we're oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah totally yeah, same. Yeah. I actually looked it up. You are in 12 states, Robert. I'm in 38. He's <laughs> in 42. I mean, it, it is Potato, potato. Is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so he's we, got Ohio, you know, whatever. We know what our biggest turns hinder- out it's not a competition. <laughs> Everything is in it? life Unless is not a competition. No, no, no. Uh, what do you think is next? Do we ever see a twenty dollar on the shelf great whiskey and an OG one fourteen? Is it five years away? Is it twenty years away? What, when do we start seeing Texas whiskey being such a widely bought thing, widely produced thing that we start? I don't seeing- see a whole lot of twenty dollar bottles of anything anymore. I don't know about you. So how low do you think it'll go? Do you think it'll I mean, be sub-30 commonly? Here, I'm going to tell you right now that I think we have, again, there's not a lot of mm. super large distilleries in Texas because I think only a distillery that's really large can hit a $20 price point because of production costs, because volume, of all the things. Yeah. And they're not going to be using, they're going to be using commodity grain, But which is the other thing that small producers just like, why would I do that? Don't, don't yeah. typically do, but we, we do expensive. have one in Texas that I think is not... Again, that other other states don't necessarily have, and I think that Gulf Coast here in Texas, in Houston, ha- in Houston here, and again, personal friend of both of us, I think they have the ability to hit a well aged Texas whiskey at a really reasonable price point uh, going forward, and I think that's it's a beautiful thing to see. I think that's again we talk about a rising tide raises all ships, and I think that's one of the things that will help. Texas whiskey ultimately is that we do have some companies like that. It's not all just a smaller, more niche distilleries that we do have large distilleries, smaller distilleries, medium sized distilleries, and having all three of those sizes will allow all of those price points to come forward eventually. So what are we thinking? 10 years, less than 10. I think, I think five, honestly. And once again, like the, 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 the rest of what's happening in whiskey Impact that seem yeah, different, right? Yeah. Like we've been talking about, like getting bookers for forty-five. Like it seemed, seemed crazy ten years ago. Now they'd be like, "Yeah, no problem." If I it's want a insane. bottle of bookers, that'd be. I'm gonna pay seventy-nine dollars, um, seventy-nine ninety-nine. No, no issue. So in some ways, if everybody can just hold their prices normal, <laughs> while everything else goes up, it'll feel like, you know, we're in the same range. And I think also so there's some strategic stuff. I'm not once again, I'm not really that much of a business guy, but you know, there's always. You know, you make a ton of margin on like a few bottles, or you can make much less and do a bunch. Um, and but, and I, I, we kind of keep siding, at least in the last few years, on the side of man. I want this to be accessible. I want people to get into it if they want to. I don't want 
I don't want price to be what's keeping someone out of getting either in the two main categories to go back to like, you know, some, some future date where I'm going to look back on, on, on my work in this, in this specific industry, the birth, basically not even basically the birth of Texas whiskey and the rise, if not birth of American single malt are two things we've gotten to be really closely connected to um, whole regions that don't have whiskey being made in them. How often does that come around that you get to be like in on the ground floor of that? And then same thing to the, the, the emergence of a new style that it does, didn't exist. Um, so those are, those are pretty cool things to like, you know, kind of like feather in your cat about, those but beautiful things like heaven Hill, the bottle and bond used to be years ago or not even that long ago, a certain price point, a certain, certain availability isn't the same. And I no, think that it's not again, hopefully that's what we end up doing is that every region ends up having major producers. They're able to produce that kind of high quality, lower price point and also crazier stuff at higher price point. And that's, I think that's a cool variety to have between that 30 to $60 price point. And that's, what I think the, it'll be yeah. I think it'll be interesting to see what the next ten years does for Texas whiskey. I think we will as it can. I don't. A couple years ago, people talked about a bubble. Right. I don't think we're having a bubble. I think what we'll have is a bubble in terms of greediness. I don't. Th- I, th- I don't think you can continue to get away with these hundred and fifty dollar, three hundred dollar price point. Yeah, yeah. I think those will go away. Charging uh, three hundred dollars for thirteen year old Dickel. But as we continue, correct. Uh, what's that? Blue Swift, what it's called, Sweet Sweetens Cove. Sweet, Sweetens Cove. Uh, I, th- I think as we continue to see Texas evolve for the better, I don't think it's beyond reason to imagine a scenario five to ten years from now where Texas is more coveted than a lot of Kentucky pr- pr- produced stuff. It's just not as good as it used. I know that's saying a lot, but if you think about it, we've every time we get together in Waco, we bring Dusties. We're not bringing current releases. Mm. Even as great as Four Roses is, it's not as good as it was just five years ago because you are producing for a much your millions of audience versus you know what I mean. So I think I think we'll see a decline, maybe uh, maybe a plateau at least for Kentucky bourbon, whereas can, Texas will continue to, to to grow and improve and and establish itself in its own lane versus being compared to Kentucky. Yeah. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how the next five to 10 years looks. Absolutely. And there's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, honestly, like craft beer, which people also don't realize, like the first wave of American craft beer started in the late seventies. And most, most people weren't either alive or weren't drinking then. Um, but neither people are now, I mean, we all know that whiskey is exploding, right? I mean, just there's new entries. Wait, what Jared? New entries to the, yeah. <laughs> what? Take your money. Call your accountant and put Man. some money in on whiskey. Um, Just not on. MGP but there are people stuff. who people who are now yeah. cutting their teeth on whiskey, getting the whiskey bug in the middle of what's been happening. And so, I think some of the things that we talk about is even things that are difficult for people to transition to. You know, we don't need to we don't need to do a okay boomer th- situation, but. But again, at the end of the day, the beauty of it is that there's so much well, flavor variety that's developing. Sure. And I think that I think the best thing for American whiskey that we p- could possibly do is to develop a wider flavor pl- palette, a wider flavor availability. Well, there's I, I was just going to say yeah. that the, a wider expectation. Yeah. The goal for any of these things, whether we're talking about sociopolitical stuff or not, is not like, oh, let's just let all the old guys die out and then we can start over. But there is some <laughs> aspect... <laughs> There's some aspect of, of that that's going to be true. There are people today who are spending way more than they should of their of their budget for the year on booze because like they've got the bug. They've got this whiskey bug and they are just they're trying things, they're buying things. Who cut their teeth on craft stuff. So they're not struggling with that whole this doesn't taste like Kentucky, you know? This doesn't taste like Scotland. Sure. That's not an issue for them. And that's a lot of people if you just look at Whiskey consumption PDF. growth over the last it, it, ten years. Well, a lot more educated consumer with better expectations. Sure. Yeah, agreed. And and they and, and they got into it when there was a different. The landscape was different. The Correct. map was different. It wasn't Kentucky, Scotland, Ireland. You really Indiana. taste the fertilizer in this. Um. Yeah. The anyway, fertilized yeast. So that'll be an interesting dynamic too. 
I'm sure you guys see it too, but watching people who, hey, I kind of liked whiskey here and there. I had a few with my buddies, but the thing that like put it over the top for me was one of your products. Obviously, then you're starting with a, just, just a different baseline than someone who Scotland, Ireland, Kentucky was your baseline. Sure. Um, and there's just more and more people like that. So I think the the options of what's available. And, and don't get me wrong. Everyone who's like, oh, these small producers or Texas whiskey don't know what they're doing yet. I, I don't want anyone to ever think that we're like, uh, just kind of like smoothing over the fact that we're still learning. It's still very young. We know stuff's not perfect. That is very different than it's not Kentucky. And those are separate conversations. Sure. But they are simultaneously both happening, yeah. which is the whiskey keeps getting better because we're a bunch of self-taught dudes that have been doing this for a little bit over a decade. And it's also never going to taste like Kentucky. But we constantly And have that's to, what you want by Kentucky. It's fine. Do you think it's it could be done? I mean, theoretically, I just a random question. But if you said, let's say, Bryn Elliott came to Texas, brought his still, a still from Four Roses, and did a run, same process that they do, you think it would taste? I think my again to me, Milam Greens are the example of this. Like they get distillate from Kentucky that they distill there, and they bring it to Texas and age it here maturation matters at the end of the day the how quickly it's going in and out of the cask how what those casks how those casks interact with that spirit is going to make a difference no matter what you do no matter where you age a spirit like it's going to have an influence and so you will never get a spirit that's a hundred percent one way or the other i think you can get based on distillation fermentation you can get very much cleaner lighter spirit you can get more kentucky ish spirit sure and i think that's a beautiful thing from the column distilled spirits here in texas is that they're way more traditional and i don't think there's any question that those are able to accomplish a more traditional profile um at the end of the day like i they're not still like again if you still taste those versus the exact same thing that was made in kentucky at the same age they're not going to taste the same. One of the big things, obviously, maybe you could answer this because I don't actually know, but is anybody doing back set? I think almost everybody who's doing bourbon in Texas is doing sweet mash. Um, n- no, I don't know. Not everybody, anyone... but maybe. Is someone else, uh, you know, doing sour mash? We do. We do half, a little less than half of what we do is sour mash. Like actually with back set? Mm-hmm. Okay. But the large majority of just craft period is sure. going to be sweet There's mash. There's not a whole like, lot. We're not really yeah. Even in today. Kentucky, yeah. We're yeah. not. Well, well peerless, we, peerless those guys is are all sweet, sweet mash. mash. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Me talking about something like Four Roses. I believe Old Forester's new facility is also sweet mash. Thanks so much for coming. I really appreciate you guys driving down. Uh, let's go get some food and yeah, cheers. Cheers. Let's Enjoy get your drinking. charcoal filter in heaven hell there. <laughs>